I had been, well, first of all, let me just thank the organizers for an opportunity to speak today. Um, obviously, I'm not a neurosurgeon, so this is um, a slightly different area for me. I've had the opportunity to work with Mohamed Al Beltegi and with Lily Gumnarova now for many years. Um, and what I was going to ask to do was really talk about some of the recent advances in molecular biology uh, in the context of pediatric brain tumors. Um, admittedly, there have been a lot of advances. So I thought what I would do is instead of focusing on any one advance, is I would talk about them in the more general sense. And then for each advance, I've kind of provided some references so that people that are interested in them can kind of go back and look at them. So let me just see what I need to do to, okay. So uh, these are my disclosures. So as many of you are aware, I was the director of pediatric neuro-oncology at the Dana-Farber Boston Children's for many, many years, but uh, recently transitioned to industry where I run the pediatric oncology program at this whole Bristol Myers Squibb. But today's talk is not related to anything I do at Bristol Myers Squibb and doesn't even necessarily reflect um, their uh, opinions. So the objective of today's talks are really gonna to be to focus on a couple of areas. The first is what we actually mean by molecular therapies and how they're identified. And in particular, the difference between what a targeted therapy is versus what a pathway therapy is, because those are often used somewhat interchangeably, even though they don't mean the same thing. I'm gonna talk a little bit about how to obtain the tumor when and where in the context, not of the uh, treatment that neurosurgeons think about, but more in the context of how to do the molecular biology that's gonna be so critical. And then finally, I'm gonna talk about some of the targets that have been identified as well as the potential for some of the therapies that have worked and where we go from here. So um, under those, uh, what I'm gonna do is start with this concept of tumor targets and pathways, because um, what we're most interested in are tumor targets. These are basically targets that can be used to identify and potentially direct therapy against a tumor cell. And so a good example would be BRAF V600E. This is obviously a mutation that doesn't occur in any normal cell of the body. And so if you could have a drug that attacks only the BRAF V600E mutation, you could presumably target every tumor cell and not touch a single normal cell in the body. And thus you should have virtually no toxicity whatsoever. And this is kind of what we are shooting for in the context of targeted therapy. I will tell you there are virtually none of these in existence. Even the example I gave, BRAF B600E, as I'll point out later, is not truly a uh, mutation-specific drug, which is why it has so many side effects. It's because it hits normal BRAF as well. So the second type that's a little more common than what we would have wanted, the tumor-specific ones, are what are referred to as tumor-predominant antigens. So these are the targets that are present on or in tumor cells but are also present on some normal cells. For those of you that follow the leukemia fields, for example, um, the ability to target CD19 leukemia, which is the common form of childhood ALL, wipes out virtually all of the leukemias and has revolutionized the therapy for that disease. The problem is it also wipes out all of the normal B cells that also express CD19, which means you don't make any immunoglobulin um, because you've lost all of those cells. So uh, great for anti-tumor effect, bad for some of the long-term toxicity. And in terms of brain tumors, uh, CMYK is the same thing. It is, as you in fact heard, it's present on uh, certain types of group three medulloblastoma, but CMYK is also present in normal cell and you can't hit the tumor CMYK without hitting the normal CMYK as well. And so you have to accept some level of normal disruption. What accounts for most of what we do though, um, that we call targeted therapy, isn't that targeted at all. It's typically the interference of an entire pathway. So um, in this context, and if we took, for example, neurofibromatosis low-grade gliomas, if we took the BRAF KIAA1549 uh, fusion uh, pediatric low-grade gliomas, some of which Lily had talked about previously, um, we treat them with MEK inhibitors. Now, remember, the patient doesn't have any mutation in MEK. They actually have mutations either upstream 
um, around the B, around RAS or around BRAF, but we shut down the entire pathway via inhibition of MEK as a way of stopping the signal, which means not only are we inhibiting the pathway in all of the tumor cells, we're inhibiting the pathway in every other cell of the body. And these pathway inhibitors, not surprisingly, um, are much easier because there are multiple places where you can inhibit the pathway. But unfortunately, they also um, cause a lot of toxicity because of the off-target effects that we see uh, from these. And again, most of the therapies we now deal with are in fact pathway targets. So here's a kind of classic example of the ras raf mech pathway. And again, you can see up here the, um, sorry, there are a couple of different mutations. And in blue, these are, are, are drugs, if we could invent them, that could be specific. Entric fusions, FGFR1 mutations, the KIAA truncated fusion, and even the BRAF E600E. Um, the drug, the, if you could invent one of those drugs, it could be tumor specific. Unfortunately, none of these actually exist right now. There are no specific, truly targeted drugs. So what we use instead, for example, in the, in the case of BRAF E600E, is a drug that does preferentially hit B600E, but unfortunately, it also inhibits normal BRAF, and that's why you get all of the um, side effects, which means it's not truly targeted um, to just the mutation. And there are multiple drug companies that are working on more specific inhibitors for every one of these so that we can get a better kind of tumor cell kill to um, normal uh, ratio. And what we're currently dealing with, though, these are the inhibitors that we're mostly using, right? The mTOR inhibitors, the MEK inhibitors, the BRAF inhibitors. There are now some new ERK and AKT inhibitors that basically shut down all of these pathways when you've got these abnormalities upstream and hence all of the um, expected side effects that come out of those. So um, we've now got a sense of what the approach to the therapy will be, whether it's tumor specific or simply pathway. And of course, the question is now that we're starting to develop these therapies, how do we get the material needed to actually make those diagnoses? Because it wasn't so important to do this before, but unlike the kinds of stuff that are done in many of the pathology labs, many of the biologic assays require material to be processed in an appropriate manner. And as Lily was just pointed out in her talk on pineal tumors, um, we're able to do more and more with less and less. Um, one of the interesting things in the context of using biopsies instead of resections is that um, there is the opportunity that the piece of tumor that we get for analysis actually doesn't represent the entire tumor. And in fact, there is now this growing concern about whether multiple biopsies from multiple areas of the tumor are going to be needed to account for the known heterogeneity of the tumors. The other thing, it's not just a question of getting a biopsy at the time of diagnosis. It's also going to be important to get them at the time of relapse or progression, because these are the kinds of um, um, new analyses that may guide us to a treatment option that wasn't there before as the tumor continues to mutate and generate new opportunities for therapy. The other thing that I think many of you are aware of is there's been really a massive explosion in our ability to begin to detect abnormalities in a serum plasma CSF. Um, so for example, you can now in many re research and a couple of clinical labs um, now diagnose the BRAF B600E mutation from CSF or blood samples. And similarly, you can now detect the H3K27M mutation in CSF without even needing to biopsy the tumor. And then, although it wasn't discussed in the imaging, um, for example, in patients with IDH1 mutations, which obviously are much more frequent in adults than in pediatric patients, you can actually detect the presence of a tumor that has IDH1 mutation in it by virtue of uh, MR spectroscopy without even doing a biopsy. So, um, there's certainly a lot of exciting things other than actual sampling the tumor that are coming about. Um, many of those are still in development, although as I've said, there is now a BRAF B600E um, as a approved assay. So some of these are actually now hitting uh, the clinical realm. What I wanted to do was talk a little bit more though about the kinds of samples that we're gonna be interested 
in terms of actually tumor analysis. And you can see that obviously those have to do with um, histology with the omics revolution, uh, you know, DNA genomic whole exome or whole genome sequencing, uh, RNA-seq, for example, methylation profiles, uh, miRNA analyses and proteomics. And more importantly, what we're beginning to understand is that it's not just what the mutations in the tumor are, it's the environment that the tumor sits in. What are the glial cells adjacent to the tumor cell telling the tumor cell? What factors are they providing? Um, what is the vascularity doing? Uh, because it's only when you put it into three dimensions with all of the cells in situ do you really begin to understand how best to attack these tumors. And obviously, part of our understanding of the biology is going to be the understanding of those elements. So um, actually, this is a slide from Lily. This was um, one of our protocols for the uh, biopsy of children with newly diagnosed untreated DIPG, where we could begin to understand uh, the biology. And um, obviously, um, Lily can answer any questions on uh, the approach. But the idea, again, was how are we ever going to cure DIPG if we don't actually find out what's driving them? And this was uh, the first uh, international protocol to actually uh, design to do that. In fact, out of that, you can now take a tumor sample um, and get a biopsy or a piece of tumor. And you can basically send it to a tumor bank. And most of the major medical centers now have these, and they're becoming critically important as the biology of tumors uh, begin to um, overtake just the use of cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, agents in a kind of non-specific treatment format. And obviously, um, FFP tissue, frozen tissue, and some that actually in Boston, for example, we were allocating directly into tissue culture and mice so that we could learn some of the biology. Again, out of these samples, you can analyze DNA, RNA, and protein using a variety of platforms that are kind of advancing almost every day. But this isn't kind of theoretical. These are the things that were being done on virtually every single patient um, that uh, was having a procedure done uh, in Boston family, if the family was willing uh, to consent. And out of those came a number of findings. And this is one um, paper from Lindsay Hoffman, um, where they had taken a four-year-old child with DIPG, and they actually analyzed six different areas of the tumor. Four of them one were from within the pons. One of them was a contiguous lesion in the right basal ganglia, and one of them was from a metastatic leptomeningeal lesion. And as you can kind of see, as you look at these six different samples that look a little bit different on histology, all of them had p53 mutations, but you'll notice some of them, for example, for PDGF alpha were wild type. Um, some of them had amplified. Some of them had just a couple of extra copies. And when you look at the mutational profile, it was interesting. Five out of the six samples actually had normal sequencing of the PDGF alpha gene, but this one sample from the right posterior pons actually showed an activating mutation in PDGF alpha. So if you had only biopsied this one area, you would think the whole tumor was, um, had a mutation in a PDGFR, and you might be looking for a PDGFR alpha inhibitor, when in fact, the other five samples don't have this at all. And, and it again kind of reinforces how absolutely critical, not just a bi biopsy are, but biopsies that really represent the um, potential heterogeneity within the tumor itself. And so this was an example of some DIPGs. These are obviously just typical immunohistochemistry of a variety. This is from a couple of different patients. Um, and again, you can stain them for specific uh, areas like the H3K27M to look for those abnormalities. The issue is that, um, um, and one of the problems of our current approaches is that each slide is a stain that gives us a little bit of information, but unfortunately then loses all of the other information on that slide. And fortunately, there have been sufficient technological advances that are now becoming routinely used um, that can begin to answer many of what have been the limitations of histology um, really over the last almost 100 years. So this is just one of the techniques. There are multiple, these are all commercial, and you can buy them, run them quite easily. This is uh, something from a company called IonPath, but again, I don't work for IonPath, I don't have anything to do with them. Um, this is what's called ion capture microscopy, where 
an antibody that detects an antigen is linked to a metal isotope. Um, and uh, in this example, there are seven different antibodies labeled in seven different colors. And basically now you can actually ask the question, where are the cells that are PD-1 positive? And where are those cells in the context of the lymphocytes that are CD8 positive? Um, because are they communicating? Remembering that PD-1 is the receptor that downregulates the immune response um, within the tumor. Now, here's an example of seven. And I showed this because so that you can kind of see the heterogeneity in the normal areas at the tumor boundary and within the tumor itself. Um, ion capture microscopy now can use up to 100 different antibody uh, metal isotopes on a single slide. So in one section, you can image 100 different variables. You could have included in this where all of the glial cells are, where all the um, uh, microglia were, where all of the blood vessels were, where all of the parasites were, and really begin to put into context who's beside whom, who's talking to whom, in this unique ability. And so you can begin to see that um, uh, histology is changing dramatically and our ability to understand the biology and thus the markers. And so you could do the same thing. One of the stains, for example, could be the BRAF D600E mutant antibody to look to see exactly where those cells are and what they're around. Um, obviously there have been enormous um, advances in um, DNA, RNA and miRNA sequencing. Um, and this is just a review article that, that will give you a great uh, description of where each of those stand from Paul Northcott's group. Um, and again, if you want to start looking at, for example, what are the relevant ways in which to do DNA mutations, in this case, either with whole genome or whole exome sequencing, you can look at copy number alterations, molecular subgrouping assignment, the fusions that drive certain tumors like the BRAF KIAA, that I mentioned before, um, aberrant gene expression abnormalities, um, as well as a variety of epigenetic changes like those we see um, with DIPG, the H3, uh, K27, or G34 mutations. All of these technologies have now been kind of standardized, and as you saw, are actually being incorporated into the new 2021 WHO uh, classification. None of these, these are all now relatively routine, and for places that don't have this technology, Places like, for example, the Comprehensive Inform Sequencing Network at Heidelberg will actually do sequence your samples for you if you want to send them. So that's an easy collaboration for people that don't have this technology but still want to know what the molecular subgrouping of many of their tumors are. And it only takes a couple of weeks to get the answer back so that by the time the patient is recovered from their surgery, um, you might be ready to have that information in hand. So um, this was an analysis that, that we did um, um, looking at the molecular sequencing of both midline, um, what we now call midline gliomas, um, including those that are H3 uh, mutated, as you can see up here, uh, comparing them to cortical tumors that predominantly have the G34 mutations as opposed to the H3K27. And again, what you can begin to see is we're recognizing all of these different abnormalities and obviously, as you begin to think about some of the treatment options, so for example, you do see BRAF mutations in a small percentage of cortical tumors, but because there are drugs for those, uh, those are high-grade gliomas that could potentially be effectively uh, treated. Same for some of the IDH1. We now have, for example, inhibitors. Uh, these pink ones, for example, are ACDR1 in some of the DIPGs. As I pointed out, there are PI3 kinase pathway um, inhibitors that are now approved, same for CDK2A and so forth. So you can begin to see that the biology is starting to catch up to our ability, the, um, the, some of the drugs are starting to catch up to the biology that we are recognizing in some of our uh, tumors. And um, this is perhaps best seen in the classification of tumors, which again is now being more and more recognized by the WHO. Uh, this is from um, uh, um, uh, Paul Northcott's group, but again, uh, the Heidelberg group has probably led this effort. So here is the methylation array. Methylation arrays, basically, they don't tell you what mutation is in the tumor. They tell you what developmental stage the cell was at when it became oncogenic, uh, kind of like the minute it veered off and went uh, haywire. And so 
Whereas in the old days, uh, medulloblastoma was a single entity, a small round blue cells of the cerebellum. You can see that in fact, medulloblastoma is these four different entities that are easily differentiated by uh, methylation arrays. Similarly, the ependymomas can be easily differentiated. Who knew that ATRT was actually three different kinds of uh, tumors and so forth. And you can begin to really put this together as we begin to isolate the individual mutations that cause each of these individual subtypes and then direct therapy specifically against them, right? Because if I told you that I had a sonic hedgehog inhibitor to treat, if you just treated all medulloblastomas, well, the three types of medulloblastoma that don't have sonic hedgehog as its driver cannot respond to a sonic hedgehog inhibitor. They have no problem with sonic hedgehog, which means these patients would only get the toxicity of the drug, none of the benefit. These are the only ones that would actually benefit. And then what's become particularly exciting for those of you that attended some of the recent sessions at the pediatric snow meeting is, uh, this is a work from Crystal Mackle's group at the Stanford where they were looking at CAR T cells directed against GD2, which is present on the majority of pediatric DIPGs. These are obviously mouse experiments where she took the GD2 specific CAR T cell, and you can see that it dramatically effectively treated these mice, where she took another CAR T cell. This is CD19. This is the one that targets the B cell antigen I mentioned in ALL. And although it would cure mice with ALL, you can see it has no effect on um, on DIPG because it expresses a different uh, target. And interestingly, they have now started the clinical trial and she recently just presented some of the early results showing responses in some of those patients with progressive recurrent um, DIPG using some of these CARs now in, in actual children. So this is a review article that's maybe worthwhile uh, taking a look at that kind of summarizes the major molecular subtypes that you heard about before for medullo, for the other um, small round blue cell tumors, um, these are the three subtypes of atypical teratoid tumor, the nine types of ependymoma, as well as those for high-grade gliomas, both hemispheric and the DIPG. So this is in this single article, you can kind of get a sense of where most of the things uh, stand. But what I wanted to do was, and I've provided a reference for each of these so that if you want to see the individual ones, because as, as was mentioned previously, medulloblastoma is no longer just four categories. It's actually now 12 categories. And um, so for those of you that are interested in even a little more detail, um, um, these articles are available. Although right now, the only targeted therapy we have for medulloblastoma are for sonic hedgehog tumors, um, and now some for the MYC amplified tumors using some of the um, uh, BET inhibitors. So although we're breaking these into multiple categories, for many of them, we don't actually have any specific uh, therapy, but the assumption is that those will come with time. So here's um, the classic, one of the classic papers for the nine subcategories of ependymoma. Here are the three subcategories for ATRT, based on whether on the left-hand side you use the German classification or on the right-hand side you use the Toronto classification, although they basically mean the same thing. Um, here is the differential for both midline and hemispheric low-grade gliomas based on their tumor type and histology, incorporating the uh, new classification uh, into them, as well as um, how to kind of approach these patients in terms of who gets a uh, BRAF inhibitor, who gets a MEK inhibitor. This is uh, the uh, nine um, subclassifications now from um, the group at uh, the Royal Marsden, looking at high, pediatric high-grade gliomas, both brainstem and non-brainstem. And again, um, the uh, different approaches. And although we're just now beginning to develop some of the therapies, like the CAR T cells that I talked about for the H3K27M, there are more and more of these coming. As you know, there are clinical trials in adults for IDH1 mutant tumors, even though those are relatively uncommon. Obviously, the BRAF and low-grade gliomas, uh, for which we already have both BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And then finally, ETMR, a, you know, relatively rare tumor. Um, unfortunately, it gets even rarer because it turns out ETMR is not a single tumor. It can actually be broken into four separate molecular subgroups based on 
uh, what drives the abnormality, which again means that we may need to come up with separate therapies for each of those uh, four entities. And then uh, this is just a review that kind of takes what are now, what are known as some of these subgroups. So here, for example, are the um, approaches being used for the sonic hedgehog medulloblastoma. Here are some of the approaches in this review article for the H3K27M mutant high-grade gliomas. Here are some of the approaches for the low-grade gliomas with either BRAF or MEK inhibitors and so forth. And so for those of you that want a simple a kind of review article that summarizes the status of that. Uh, this is a relatively update the uh, paper only published less than a year ago that has this uh, information. And then um, in the same paper um, uh, from uh, Sabina M uh, Mueller's group is again, um, it can go by the disease, the WHO classification, what the tumor type is, what the target is, whether it's a fusion, a mutation, an amplification, what the kind of therapy is, and what drug you might actually use to consider treating those patients if you've done the molecular profile. And then she does the same thing this time by looking at what is the inhibitor, what's the name of the drug, what disease could you use it for, when would you use it, and what are the open clinical trials. And again, this is relatively recent, uh, published within the last year, if you're interested uh, in that. And so what I'm going to do now is just very quickly show you a couple of examples because it's not all just theoretical. In fact, this is a patient we had from Boston that had a child with a um, BRAF B600E uh, tumor that was progressive after chemotherapy. We started this patient on just uh, an oral a drug called dabrafenib, a BRAF B600E inhibitor from Novartis. And you can see within eight weeks, there is still just a little spot there. So this was considered a partial response but that's still a pretty good partial response, uh, I think, in anybody's book. And um, again, we're seeing complete and partial responses in a very high percentage of these uh, patients. And so, as Lily was pointing out, you wouldn't want to do an aggressive surgical procedure, per se, when you could get these kinds of responses with a once-a-day oral medication. And it's not just, that's not just the sole example, since we often just tend to show one. Um, this, for example, are entrite fusions. These are pediatric patients with brain tumors. And again, you can see on this waterfall, the vast majority of patients are responding and some of the responses are very dramatic. Here's an example of two patients on the Sonic Hedgehog trial we ran. Um, these are patients that are really considered incurable. They're, they're after, they've relapsed after radiation. Um, they ha had both had multiple relapses in this 11 and 4.5 year old child. And you can see both of them had complete responses to this uh, daily uh, sonic hedgehog inhibitor drug, recognizing that there are some toxicities to the drug that you do have to be aware of. But certainly, at least based on biology, these drugs have shown significant efficacy. And there is now an international trial for adolescent and adults with sonic hedgehog tumors actually using sonic hedgehog inhibitors at the time of diagnosis. And then here's some of the newer. This is a metabolic drug, uh, ONC201. Again, this is a large randomized trial that's going on now, but this was from the original phase one, two. And again, there are some very nice responses being identified in uh, this drug as well. Um, and then finally, uh, as you know, for congenital mismatch repair tumors, again, where patients tend to have a high mutational burden, immunotherapy appears to have a role in this circumstance. So this is nivolumab, a PD-1 um, in, PD, uh, PD inhibitor that again showed a nice complete response uh, in these patients um, and um, is actually, there is now a large international trial going on uh, to better define the activity of this. But interestingly, in the relapsed patient population from the hospital for sick children with congenital mismatched uh, glioblastoma, the median survival on checkpoint inhibitors um, is over three years, which of course is much longer than even the the median survival of newly diagnosed uh, GBM patients. So again, really showing quite dramatic responses and durability of responses in a patient population that you wouldn't think would do particularly well for particularly long. And so I've just shown a couple of examples um, of, of how this works. But I wanted to just finish with one last slide. And that is, because I don't want to kind of leave the impression that we have solved all of the problems and that now you just have to do the biopsy, find the target, and you're done. Um, in fact, if you take all of the patients with all of these targeted therapies together, 
the enteric fusions, the BRAF, hydrogliomas, and so forth. Right now, we're curing about 5% of the patients with pediatric um, uh, brain tumors using these targeted therapies. Obviously, the low-grade glioma patients weren't dying anyways. They had a lot of morbidity, but not so much mortality. The problem is that this, these therapies have not worked in the majority of patients, and maybe that's not such a surprise. You know, when you take a highly malignant, for example, glioblastoma that has already seen radiation, multi-agent chemotherapy, um, that, for example, has, let's say, an EGFR mutation, the idea that a single EGFR inhibitor is suddenly going to make that tumor disappear is maybe a little overly optimistic. As I think most of you are aware, this is the way we draw the EGFR pathway, right? It dimerizes, it activates either the PI3 kinase pathway or the ras raf mech pathway that I talked about previously, where you might think that you want either an mTOR inhibitor or, and or an ERK uh, inhibitor, and yeah, those would be fine, although we tested those and uh, those didn't work all that well either. You could, of course, try an EGFR inhibitor, but when we say that this is the pathway, and so it should be easy to inhibit this, this is in fact what the EGFR pathway actually looks like. So this is EGFR right here. And you can envision when you try to inhibit this, all of these other pathways are kicking in to salvage the signal, which is why a single EGFR inhibitor turned out not to cure even adult or pediatric EGFR mutant malignant gliomas. There were too many salvage pathways, which means we're gonna to have to understand this biology if we are gonna to put together the right combinations of targeted therapies and pathway inhibitors in order to finally shut this pathway down and presumably stop those tumor cells uh, from uh, dividing. So um, I'm gonna stop there. Uh, just recognize that again, um, in the context of targeted therapies, um, we have to be committed to getting tumor tissue. It has to be the right tissue from the right places um, in all of the circumstances that will actually guide us in the recognition that there may be some new opportunities to get material in other ways that will reduce some of the morbidity of these approaches. That obviously we are making advances in our understanding, but we have a long way to go, particularly as we try to put things in the context of their microenvironment and the much more complicated pathways that actually signal these tumors. And I think by doing so, although we have some very exciting successes, uh, we're still not curing the majority of patients, which means there's a long way to go. And our hope is that some of the new drugs being developed, as well as our better understanding of the molecular targets of pediatric brain tumors uh, will provide the Achilles heels on which those can be treated. And so I'll stop there. I know I went very quickly. So if there are any specific questions, either now or after the talk, always feel free uh, to reach me. I'm happy to kind of answer whatever questions I can. And I'll stop there um, and maybe stop sharing. Thank you, Mark. Very interesting presentation as usual. Uh, do we have any questions? So actually, uh, do you think we are over operating? We will come sometime to say that we are over operating cases. Well, I, I mean, I think Lily kind of answered that question, you know, that the change in the operative approaches for pineal tumors, because again, if you can diagnose a germ cell tumor from CSF and or blood, uh, with germ cell markers, you don't need to do a big complicated operation. So there's a place where, I mean, right, the tumor markers are to some extent, they are tumor markers, they're part of the tumor biology, and they've been critical in terms of guiding our approaches to germ cell tumors. Um, for the for the tumor markers that aren't so obvious, like BRAF, we're beginning to figure out ways of getting those from blood and CSF, um, which I think will begin to make some of those, right, if you could, if you could determine that a patient has a BRAF KIAA1549 truncated fusion with a lesion that, that's in an area that's not causing a lot of problems, you know, maybe hydrocephalus and you could just, um, you could do a third ventriculostomy or something, maybe um, you wouldn't need to do a big operation. There would be opportunities to let the targeted therapy actually treat those patients. So I think like everything, um, 
pathology, neurosurgery, oncology, radiation oncology, and radi radiology are all going to end up working together to slowly improve the way in which we approach patients uh, to minimize morbidity and improve outcome. If I may just comment, uh, Mohammed, and I think you also know that, but really, um, I think if we have good markers, then our goals of surgery are not going to be are going to be different. Our goals of surgery are going to be towards either treating hydrocephalus or treating mass effect to the extent that that is causing the problem. So it's going to be much more targeted surgery, if I can use that word, rather than the old sort of fashioned way of there is a tumor there, we need to go and take it out no matter what. So I think understanding the biology as Mark is showing it is going to be critical uh, and guide us in the surgery, not just for pineal, but for any tumor in the brain. I think for medulloblastomas with the new molecular classification, with some of these new classifications, there would be a rule only for biopsy and we will not go for a total excision as we used to. I know people have talked a lot about that, but my concern is with medulloblastoma, and I'm sure you and Llewellyn and all the other neurosurgeons know it. Sometimes you have to take all the tumor out because it doesn't stop bleeding until you've taken out all the tumor. So in the posterior fossa, sometimes that's a little tricky. But if we have ways of doing it without causing morbidity, then yes. Yeah, I mean, I would add to that, that, you know, from an oncologic point of view and, and long-term follow-up of many of those patients, sometimes posterior fossa syndrome is becoming one of the major impacts of the treatment of medullal blastoma. Um, and under those circumstances, if there were a way, uh, you know, the best way to avoid posterior fossa syndrome would not be to have to go in and dig all of that stuff out. So here's a circumstance where if you knew there were other options or opportunities, um, that could significantly impact not so much the cure rate, because most, the majority of, of medullal blastoma medulloblastoma patients are already cured, it could impact the long-term morbidity of those patients simply by avoiding that and letting the radiation and chemotherapy, particularly if you knew it was the type of tumor that was likely to be very responsive, a typical, you know, sonic hedgehog or wind tumor, as opposed to a MYC amplified group three, where maybe you are willing to be a little more aggressive, given how aggressive those tumors can be. Yeah. Perhaps I could just add a quick point. I see Moody's got his hand up. I don't want to jump in ahead of you again, Moody. So maybe just go ahead and make your point, Moody, I think, in fairness. Go for yeah. it. Now, uh, amazing talk, a lot of information uh, and uh, giving hope for future uh, treatments, obviously. My uh, question is fairly mundane. How does immunocytochemistry relate to the molecular biology information that you're getting in the overall management of a patient? Yeah, that's a great question. And the good news is that they are catching up. So there are now antibodies that can recognize the difference between um, normal, the trimethylated H3 and the K27M mutation. So you don't need a molecular profile. You can do that on a tumor sample. The BRAF B600E, the same thing. Um, there are now techniques for identifying uh, the, um, the uh, KIAA-1549 truncated fusion without having to actually sequence uh, the tumor in the same way that we can also now detect beta-HCG and alpha-feta protein. Um, so there are a lot of assays. Um, not all of this is based on having to actually sequence the tumor. And in that sense, I think we're catching up. Um, obviously, you can do the same thing for WINT, um, where I, whereas there are some things that are still hard to do. I mentioned, for example, um, I know in the adult program at the Dana-Farber before I left, um, for adults that had um, certain lesions, they would send them to the MRI scanner and actually uh, diagnose the IDH1 mutation based on um, MR spectroscopy, not biopsy. Um, so it's not even all histochemistry. Even we're seeing some of the advances in radiologic techniques are able to help guide some of the diagnoses in these circumstances. Great. Thank you very much. So, 
but perhaps I can just add to that. I think I think that's ex exactly the, the point I, I was going to make, uh, Mark. I mean, a, as we see advances in radiomics improving, we, we probably will make those diagnoses at some point radiologically and not even have to, you know, sample any 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 tissue at all. Well, right. Um, but again, so I showed that example of the patient that had the six different biopsies from their tumor that had, you know, had mutations in one part of the tumor, but not in another part of the tumor. And one of the real problems with, with cancer biology in general is the heterogeneity within the tumor. And the question is the techniques, the, the, the precision of the Radio, radiomics is going to have to be sufficient that it can pick up that heterogeneity. So I don't think the pathologists and the molecular biologists are going to be out of a job for at least a little while longer. I think that's going to take some time, but you're absolutely right. As those techniques get better, as molecular imaging becomes better, I could absolutely see a time when even they will be able to pick up a, a pick, you know, a, a, a PDGFR alpha mutation in part of the tumor where other parts are negative and help guide those very questions. Yeah, that, that's a good point. One thing I can add to that is that we've seen with, um, when you talk about the heterogeneity within a tumor, even the MR spectroscopy, when you place multivoxel, uh, if you do multivoxel, you do multiple single voxels, you can see the difference in spectral profiles within a, one, a single mass of a tumor, but each voxel is picking up a different uh, biological profile. And that's, going back to radiomics, one of the challenges we're gonna have is with large numbers and the inconsistency in uh, imaging protocols. So if you, apply a pro if you apply an algorithm to say, this is my radiomic algorithm, I've evaluated it on this cohort, is the imaging protocol gonna be the same at another institution? Because I didn't go into details of like the TR, TE and all that, um, MR physics that no one probably wants to listen to. And uh, it's, it's challenging even for radiologists to understand completely. But when you talk about those differences in technique, it's gonna play more of a role when you talk about radiomics because that slight difference that you might not pick up with the naked eye might be a difference for a, a computer algorithm. And the other thing is um, when you talk about those differences that's why groups like RAPNO and other committees that are trying to standardize imaging protocols, they will play, I think, a bigger role in radiomics as they, as these imaging protocols are more standardized and implemented. Yeah, I completely agree. And I should have pointed out, so I sent this talk to Mohammed El Beltegi. And um, so I'm happy to have, uh, you can share that freely with everybody on the call. I, I had hoped that the references will be a guide for people as they want to see more information in specific areas. So um, for anybody that wants it to feel, I hope, my home and I hope it's okay that um, I use your email address as the place to get that information. That's great for me, Mark. If I may, uh, uh, from what I'm hearing and from what you're saying is, do you foresee a time where stereotactic biopsy is not going to be a good idea to do? No, I, I, I'm, I, well, you know, for those of you that are Star Wars fans and, and you know, who knows what we're going to be able to do 20 years or 30 years down the road. Uh, certainly, I don't think any of you are going to be out of a job in the short term. I think neurosurgery is going to continue to play the dominant role right now in the diagnosis, in the identification of the tumor types, and a critical role still in their treatment. Um, the question of whether or not as therapies improve, and we like, for example, the low-grade gliomas with the KIAA truncated fusion, right? We've now got medical therapy that is effective at treating, not all of them, not all of them respond, but the majority do. Um, those are patients that we might be able to save an operation for. Um, do I think that, that that advancement is going to happen in other tumor types as well? Um, I think over time it will, but this is going to be a slow process, right? We've been trying to cure cancer for a long time. And every time we think we've got cancer in our sites, it mutates in a way that we didn't expect. And uh, so I have to assume that as we use these new targeted therapies, tumors are gonna develop mutations against them. Those patients are gonna relapse. We're gonna need to continue to biopsy them. 
understand how the tumors are responding and develop a whole new wave of therapies after that. So um, at least in the short term, I think all of your jobs are, are very safe and we continue to rely on you to answer the critical questions, both in terms of diagnosis and treatment. Hey, thanks, Mark. Can I just ask, uh, so just a sort of a protocol related question, perhaps Ashim, you can take this. So, I mean, biobanking obviously is such a valuable tool, uh, Mark. I mean, you agree, specifically for countries, you know, that are trailing behind in this molecular biological profiling. If you can't do it now and you bank them, at least you can do it in the future. Is there something along those lines, Ashim, do you think, where we do MR spectroscopy on all patients with tumors and then post process algorithms? Is there a, sort of a tool? in place for, for something like that, do you think? Yeah, that's good, a good point. And that, that, that is the direction we're heading. Actually at CHOP, like I said, I've only been here two days, so I'm still learning how these databases work. But there's a database called D3B, which is an open source database where anyone can submit, not just imaging, but the genetic information, the tissue samples, um, any history. So all that goes into a database and what the goal would be is to collect all of that, analyze it with a similar algorithm. That way, results are more uniform and also the numbers are more powerful to improve our whatever it is, radiomic analysis, if you're looking at just molecular analysis. But specifically talking about imaging, yes, that will help us because we can actually extract some of the DICOM data to understand the differences in technique between the sequences. But at the same time, our algorithms can now analyze multiple studies, multiple MR spectroscopy uh, profiles. And it, I think it's important to try to standardize those sequences beforehand, but it, it will be helpful to analyze with a sim similar algorithm. So I think that's where I mentioned RAPNO, which is uh, one of the committees that's trying to standardize imaging protocols. And one of the reasons, I think the number one reason is that case is when it comes time to analyze this as a multi-institutional study, now we have the capability to be more consistent and produce more reliable results. And actually, let me just add one thing about that. I'm actually working with the Children's Oncology Group, which is um, centered here in the United States, but we're working on a, on a paper uh, on brain tumors, spine tumors, and also on uh, head and neck tumors. And the goal of the paper is to standardize the imaging protocol for all brain tumors. So RAPNO focuses like ependymoma, medial blastoma, high grade, low grade. This, this paper that should be coming out early next year or by the mid of next year, we actually just started working on it, will help standardize imaging protocols for all institutions. So take a look out for that as well. Yeah, that's great, Ashim. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, any any questions? Doctor Nasser is here. Yeah. Okay, Lewalen. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Th so thanks. If, yeah, uh, Mohammed doesn't look like we have any questions. Nas, you have any comments you want to make there, or you? Oh no, thank you, Leon. I'm just following that discussion. It's very interesting, actually. Yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe so, Lily. Any clo closing comments? Uh, no, I just want to uh, thank Mark and uh, my colleague Ashim, who I've never met, uh, for great talks. And I want to kind of respond about the role of surgery. I think. There will be obviously still a role for, for surgery, but it's going to be a modified role of surgery. So I think we're going to see uh, shifts in what the goals are going to be um, as we know more, uh, whether it's through imaging or through some of the molecular analyses uh, and the therapeutic uh, opportunities that we have. So I think uh, neurosurgeons uh, are still going to be needed, but I think our roles are going to be somewhat different. Um, there still will always be the need to do surgery for mass effect and hydrocephalus, which I don't think are going to be answered by the imaging um, and the molecular stuff. 
but um, it's going to be a very different paradigm that we have. And we just need to stay abreast of all of the advancements. Great, thanks. Mohammed, do you wanna wrap things up? Yeah, I would like first uh, to thank, uh, of course, John Bennett for this broadcasting and uh, nice uh, arrangements. And thank to all the speakers, Ashim, for a nice presentation. And uh, of course, Lily Gunarova for wrapping up all the protocol for pineal tumor and Mark Hearing for the advancement in the biology of the brain tumors, which we are hoping that uh, will keep us in work in business, not uh, to stop operating. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Moody Qureshi, the president of the CANS, and Professor Nasr al Ghandour, the secretary of the CANS and the president of the ESMS for the support of this webinar series. And of course, uh, my uh, friend and dear colleague, Llewellyn, who is helping a lot and making this happen. So we are doing these webinars every second Tuesday of every month. And we hope that we are uh, advancing or helping in the advancement of this pediatric uh, neurosurgery in uh, the African continent. Thanks to everyone. And uh, Owelin, if you wanna add something. No, no, thanks Mo. Again, just a thank you to John for all the work in sort of putting together and spreading the word. Thanks so much, John. Yeah, you know, uh, great online pediatric neurosurgery education. And, and let me just show you what's coming up uh, this week which includes, uh, okay, this is uh, basically, uh, there's a, a, neuro, a Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds. Uh, he's gonna talk about spinal, Dr. Sabea, Ibrahim Sabea, big Middle East educator. He's gonna talk about uh, uh, that topic. And we have one in Spanish on Thursday and Friday, uh, Friday, uh, a big name, uh, Pascal Jabor, from Philadelphia, he's going to give his uh, presentation on Friday with Yuha Hernandez Niemi. Uh, there, may, perhaps Nasser wants to say a word about his conference on Friday. Yes, John, uh, this is important uh, uh, event. Uh, it's a World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies event, uh, and I think we have very good registrants until now, uh, and uh, three slots are remaining. This is about neurotraumatology. And we have five eminent speakers from different continents. We are doing uh, this uh, webinar in collaboration with the Neurotraumatology Committee of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies and myself as second vice president of the World Federation of Neurosurgical Societies and Cairns and the Egyptian Society as well. All of you are invited. Thank you. We will be able to see that on Neurosurgical TV. Also on Saturday is the Neuroendoscopy Conference from India uh, and Neurosurgical Super Sunday uh, with various topics. So thanks, everybody. And you can hang around and network. Thank you, Thank very you much. John. Thank see you, John, very much. See you in two weeks.